Hi, I'm Keith Casabon. Thanks for joining me for another episode of You First, brought to you by Disability Rights Florida. As always, the purpose of You First is to discuss the rights of individuals with disabilities, putting your rights first. In today's podcast, we're going to discuss an aspect of accessibility that's quite often overlooked. Many people are familiar with accessibility when it pertains to buildings like uh, doorways, bathrooms, etc. But there's another storefront, a virtual doorway to your business. If you haven't caught on yet, I'm talking about your website. If your website is not accessible, it's just like having a couple of steps in front of the entrance of your building with no ramp to be found. Potential customers with disabilities who cannot effectively access your website might as well be sitting at the curb unable to enter the building. Likewise, you have to make sure that your documents are accessible as well. Uh, that could include uh, Word documents, PDFs on your website, PowerPoint presentations that you either give in person or post to the website, your brochures, reports, and, and, and anything at all like that. But by following some rather basic guidelines, you can make all of those documents accessible as well. So to tell us a lot more about website and document accessibility is our guest, Mark Miller of Interactive Accessibility. So hey, Mark, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate you, you uh, letting me join your podcast. You guys are doing great, great things here. Oh, excellent. Thanks a lot. We appreciate you being here as well. So we'll just kind of start off with the, the most basic question. Why is all this important? Why is it important that websites and documents be accessible? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a good question, and that's sort of the, the million-dollar question here. And the answer uh, is, is really simple, and that is so that everyone can access your website. Presumably, um, if you're putting something out there, like, like you uh, made a great analogy to it being a storefront, you want people to walk in your storefront. Well, you want people to be able to access the content on your website and perform the tasks and stuff that they need to on your website. So if you are not accessible, you're creating barriers or barriers right. exist for uh, a certain number of people. And those people tend to be people with, uh, with disabilities that are, that are impacted. Um, you know, people with visual disabilities use a completely different way of accessing the website than people who have vision. Um, and that's something that we can kind of get into and, and, and that'll help, uh, help you guys really understand uh, what it might take for somebody who has a disability to access the same content that, uh, that people without disabilities do. Well, let's start off specifically with websites. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the aspects of a website that might cause accessibility uh, issues for, for users with disabilities? Yeah. So if you think about um, a person who, you, we'll talk about people who have a vision disability, and a vision disability can be um, anything from somebody who is completely blind to somebody who has low vision. Um, that obviously creates a, a very different circumstance than somebody who can see. So people with vision disabilities rely on an assistive technology, um, or AT, uh, as, some, as, as we in the business would refer to it. Um, and in assistive technology, there's, there's a bunch of them out there that address different needs for different people. Uh, but in the case of somebody who has a vision disability, that is a screen reader that they would use. And that screen reader reads aloud the content that you and I would uh, see visually on the screen. Or that, or that anybody you know without the vision disability would see visually on the screen, um, but that screen reader also allows that person to do a lot of things that a person with vision would do, like skim the content. So nobody wants to read a web page from the top left to the bottom right. Uh, you know, you go through, you look at the navigation, you read the headers, maybe you skip down to some links, and you move on to the next page when you find what you want. Well, the screen reader allows a person with vision disabilities to do uh, something very similar. However, if the website is not properly coded for that screen reader to work right, the screen reader can't work out what it's looking at on the site. So in other words, um, a person with vision might see large text above a paragraph and realize that that large text is a heading and that that heading is going to tell them a lot about what's below that paragraph. A person using a screen reader would say, hey, list all the headings for me because I'm trying to find a particular paragraph. But if the screen reader can't figure out what a heading is, then right. it's not going to be able to do that for them. Right. So that is, that's one example of how um, how websites can can cause issues. It's just not by being programmatically 
correct would be the way that we would say it. Um, and that stretches to a lot of things. Obviously, there's images. Um, if images are conveying context that's not contained in the regular text, um, then that image needs a text equivalent that conveys that context because obviously a screen reader can't read an image. It can't, it can't tell you what that picture is. Um, right. So how is that picture significant? So, um, you know, if you think about something like a form, uh, you, where you would go in, you'd fill out your name, maybe some information about you, uh, you know, whatever the case is. It's really a common occurrence on, on websites. I'm sure everybody out there has done it at one time or another. Uh, something as simple as the tabbing order of that form being off um, can throw a person who is either using a screen reader or, um, you know, maybe they don't have um, the ability to use a mouse uh, for, for physical reasons, right? They don't have gross motor control over their hands, or maybe they don't have arms and hands and they're, and they're accessing their computer in a different way. And they're using that tab key to tab through that field, but all of a sudden the order changes. Mm -hmm. So they go through the first couple of fields and then that uh, that cursor disappears on them and they don't know where they are uh, and they have to search around on the screen to find that again. You know, that, that becomes a right. barrier or I know another thing with forms I've, I've seen where someone with screen reader will click into the form, uh, click into a specific field. And while, you know, maybe I can see that it says first name next to it, their screen right. reader just says, you know, enter input or something like that. And well, what input is that? So that's exactly right. That's a great point. There could be a very clear visual association between the form field and the text that's telling you what's supposed to be in there, like first name, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a programmatic association that the screen reader can perceive and, and relay right. to the screen reader user. That's, that's a really good point. Um, and things just as simple as, is there a focus indicator? Uh, and a focus indicator is that thing that lets you know where the cursor is. Um, I think if anybody has a, like Netflix out there and you're using your remote and you're, and you're, and you're, you know, moving through the shows and you've got that box that highlights the show, well, you know where you are, you know, that sure. you're on, on a particular show and you can press uh, enter or whatever the, you know, whatever it is. Um, but if you suppress that, if that's gone, you can click all, all day long around these form fields and somebody who is relying on that focus indicator to know where they are and using the tab key won't know where they are, where a mouse user is just pointing at it and clicking at it. They don't, they don't rely on that focus indicator. So it goes, uh, you know, some people don't realize how important it is. Um, some of the other things I'll, I'll run through quickly, um, links, you know, you need to have a proper anchor text on the link. So a link is something that shoots you off to another website or another part of the site that you're on. And sometimes they're long and, and not very intelligible. So people will uh, anchor them into text. And if you get text like click here, um, and you do that enough times on a page, a screen reader user could say, hey, list all the links for me. And it could say, oh, home page, um, you know, contact us, click here, click here, click here, click here, click here, um, bios, click here, click here, right. click that, here. And that click, click here is not here very, is yeah, yeah, not very clear. Not very clear. So what is what happens when you click that? Where do you actually go? Um, and right. that's what needs to be succinctly. You don't have to explain it too much, but very succinctly. You know, this is contact us page. This is the, the bios. This is, you know, product information. What happens when you click on that? And don't assume that the context before it is going to be valuable to everyone because a screen you user may not even be, may not, uh, you know, maybe listing just the, the uh, links. Um, Obviously, things that are represented in audio need to have a transcript. So if you have like this podcast, um, right. I'm, I'm hoping I'm putting you on the spot now, Keith. I'm hoping you guys <laughs> transcribe it and put it on your website. We definitely do that. This accessible. Um, and then, of course, closed captioning on a video for right. uh, people who uh, can't hear um, or have hearing disabilities. You know, it doesn't mean that they can't hear. It means that they have trouble hearing or that they can't hear. And then color contrast, um, people with low vision and people with um, people who are colorblind, like my father, can have a very difficult time reading things if the contrast is not adequate. Um, and then, uh, you know, when you think about people with cognitive disabilities, um, it really helps if you're if you're presenting the content in a very clear way and you're using sort of simple uh, content, you're not getting too fancy with it because people are really trying to just get something done. So, um, 
uh, so clear right. content really helps as well. Obviously, most of our, our listeners are not going to be web designers or web mm-hmm. developers or really know how to do much about their sites, but I'm sure a lot of our listeners have websites. Maybe they run small mm-hmm. businesses or, or work for other companies that have, of course, their, their website. Who doesn't have a website nowadays? So without being a web designer or having those kind of skills to like look at the code and, and know what you're talking about, how can somebody like a layperson just see how their their website, you know, if it is accessible, if it's not accessible, how, how can they test it? Yeah, that's that's another really good question. And I'd actually, t- to be honest, put myself in that category. I'm not a technical resource at my company. Um, I'm a strategic resource, so I, I can't get down into the weeds when it comes to um, code and stuff like that. So... One of the you know biggest things that you can do, and, and maybe you're just curious uh, listening to this podcast and you want to fool around this way, but take your mouse um, and, and stick it in the drawer and try and access your website or a website out there, anything you're curious about, using um, the, t- your tab key only. And, wow. um, and what you'll do is you'll tab, you'll tab through, um, and it should jump around in a logical order. You should be able to tell where it is, like we mentioned before. Right. Um, hopefully that focus indicator is there for you. You want to check to see if you can um, activate something by hitting your enter key. Um, and that's a really, uh, in, we, we would call that in the industry, we, we would call that keyboard access. Can you access that website and do what you need to do using only the keyboard? And um, it's it's really a very good indicator and it's a very broad stroke indicator. A lot of people think about it for um, the screen reader user because obviously a screen reader user is not using a mouse. It really very specifically takes sight to aim that pointer and click on it. Sure. They're yeah. using the, the keyboard and, uh, in conjunction with their screen reader. But a lot of other people with a lot of other disabilities also rely on the keyboard only. And the example I'll give you is we had a, a wonderful woman working for us for a while. She didn't have gross motor control over her um, limbs at all and um, used what's called a head wand. So it's like, a, uh, imagine a headband with a, with a stick coming out of it, like a, right. like a magic wand, right? <laughs> a racer tip or whatever. I don't know exactly what hers looked like. And she would um, uh, use that to activate the keys on the keyboard, to press the keys on the keyboard. And um, so tabbing order is very important to somebody um, who's using a head wand like that, um, you know, or maybe only has use of one hand or, or um, uh, maybe they can, they can only tap with one hand. You know, who knows? You, you can imagine all the different circumstances. Um, so that's a really a good way to approach it. I think that keyboard access is probably one of the biggest ones. Um, you can also, uh, you know, you can actually, if you want to play with a screen reader, the NVDA, in, and I'm saying letters N-V-D-A, is a free screen reader that's out there. So it can be kind of fun to download that and try and listen to the site with a screen reader and see if you can make heads or tails of what's going on. Oh, um, interesting. You know, see if you can hear those images. And you don't have to have any technical right. expertise to do that. Um, you can, um, you know, you can play around with your contrast mode and see if you can still read stuff if you flick the high contrast on. You can, um, you can get rid of the images if you want. You can turn images on and off. Um, and you can just simply look to see if your videos are captioned. If you can, if you click right. that, if you go to YouTube, you can click the captioning. Um, if you kind of know what you're doing, you can do some things like um, turn off your CSS, but that probably gets a little bit technical. It's a little tricky. Yeah. 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 So. Right. Um, but those things should give you kind of a good, good, quick idea. Okay. What are your thoughts about online accessibility testing? You, you, there, there seems to be more and more of them popping up, but I, it, they seem to have some obvious pros, but some very obvious cons as well. So when you say online accessibility testing, are you referring to like the scanning tools that go through your site and come up with a right? You copy, you know, paste in your URL and, yep. and it, it does a scan of however levels deep you want, et cetera, and give, comes yep. back with a report. Yeah. So um, we would call that a scanning tool. And um, they, you know, my feelings are, is I think that they're excellent. Um, I think that there's, they're very valuable in the industry. However, uh, or I say in the industry or even from, for a person who's looking to get an idea of what the accessibility mm-hmm. issues on their site might be, um, however, like any tool out there, it's very important that you understand the tool and understand its capabilities and limitations. So the problems with a scanning tool like that or the, or the things to be aware of are that they're only going to catch about 30 to 40 percent of the errors. Um, it's also important to understand that they're going to return some false positives. 
And I can give you an example of that. Um, uh, an image needs alternative text, typically speaking, right? But right. there are three kinds of images out there. There's an image that has a contextual significance. So let's just say it's an image of a stop sign. It's got the word stop on it. And when you see that image, you know to stop. Um, and nowhere else in the context of the page does it say stop. Obviously, you would need alternative text with the word stop to convey what that image is trying to convey. The image right. could be decorative, though. The image could be... Um, you know, flowers in the corner of a garden center that don't have any significance to the content at all. And in that case, they should be ignored. And the image could be and what's called an active image where you click it and it goes somewhere. And it doesn't matter what is the image is as much as what happens when you click it. Right. So right. not a description of three doctors, uh, you know, with stethoscopes, but, uh, you know, text that indicates that when you click that image, it's going to go to the list of physicians. Well, the tool can tell you whether or not there's alternative text. It can't tell you whether it's appropriate or whether there should be alternative sure. text. Sure. It's a subjective so, thing, right? Yeah. So, so, there, so you have to have a certain amount of accessibility knowledge to really take advantage of them. So I think they're great. I think that they're, um, you know, if you have no knowledge, um, they're fine to mess around with and, and, and really start um, um, maybe learning some stuff by looking at it. I would caution people um, who don't, aren't coming into it with pre-existing accessibility knowledge, uh, I would caution them about actually taking action based on what it says, because you can um, make some assumptions and, and of course, kind of make things worse if, if, you've, if you get sure. unlucky. So great tools. Um, they're great in the toolbox with other tools for an accessibility professional or, or somebody who's um, got some accessibility knowledge. Uh, you know, just understand what, what they will and won't do for you. So let's say you do these tests, the, the, the online uh, accessibility scanning tools, but you do the mm -hmm. other tests like, you know, just putting away the mouse and, 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 and whatnot. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you're feeling like more and more that the website's not accessible. Uh, if, if it's your own site and you, ha and, and you have control over or what you can do with it, or, mm -hmm. or let's say it's, you, you work for a company and you go tell the right person, but at that point, what can that person do? What's the next step as far as getting that website fixed so that it's accessible? Well, I mean, they certainly can, um, you know, go, go through the web and, and try to learn some things with accessibility, learn about how to properly alt text images and stuff like that. Um, but let's say they can't even access the code. I mean, they're just, yeah, they you can't know, even they just, access the code. Right. They're, they're going to need, well, they're going to need to let their developers know. They're going to need to let sure. people who can access their code know. And um, if those people have some knowledge, they can, um, they can make some changes and mm -hmm. uh, uh, in effect the accessibility of the site. It really depends on what your end goal is. So if you're being conscientious and you know maybe you're just an individual that has a site or you're a very small company that has a site, uh, you know your developers can learn a little bit and try to make changes. But if you have a bigger need, if you're really trying to um, conform to the guidelines around accessibility and the uh, relevant guidelines are called the WCAG 2.0 AA guidelines, you need a, a third party professional. Um, it's in fact what we at Interactive Accessibility is what we do and there's um, other good companies out there that do it as well that will come in and perform an accessibility, what's called a manual accessibility audit on the website and that manual audit um, will audit a representative sample of pages um, and tell you the accessibility issues on those pages and you can use that information to make global changes on the on the site and um, that will allow your developers to not only go in there and make the changes uh, necessary to conform as closely as possible to those guidelines but also to really start to gain some very valuable accessibility knowledge themselves so when they're making changes to the site they can um, they can do that in a way that's accessible um, so it really depends on what you need but the the sort of the holy grail the end game is to have a third-party professional um, do an audit and, and really provide the developers with what's wrong and how to fix it got you all right, well, let's turn to something that we all have a little more control over, something mm -hmm. that uh, users create every day, uh, and that's just documents using a computer, yeah. whether it be a, a word processor like Word or uh, presentations through PowerPoint. Uh, what can cause those types of documents to have accessibility issues? Well, you know, it's very similar to the, to a lot of the things that we've just talked about um, on the web itself. Um, of course, when you're creating a document, there's a lot less um, actual programming. It's more of a, a content mm -hmm. type effort. So, you know, the first thing to really look at is to make sure that 
Um, if you're putting a document out there in the wild that you're not using real teeny tiny fonts, that can be right. no fun for anybody. Um, and, and fonts actually a good example of, of something that's very important. If you think about, you know, I think about my parents who's, uh, you know, they don't really consider themselves to have a disability, but their vision is certainly becoming a challenge. Um, I'm in my late forties and my vision starting to become a bit of a challenge. I so. was just thinking the same thing. I have to put on reading glasses <laughs> to read the back of a bottle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So, sure. so I, I really, you know, it's much easier for me if somebody's got a decent sized font in there, 12 points or so, and I'm not sure. having to figure out how to zoom and stuff to, to look at it. Um, Proper formatting, you know, good justif justifying and using block paragraphs, uh, not doing crazy things like uh, making things all caps or anything that might throw off the way that we're used to perceiving, um, mm -hmm. you know, text-based content. Um, the really interesting thing about Word, if you haven't discovered this already, is that you actually can create um, a semantic structure with Word. So, I'm sure everybody's seen up in that tool ribbon where it has the headings and uh, up there, heading one, sure. heading, two, heading three, and normal and all that. And uh, I think a lot it's, of people look at that and go, oh, cool, I could set formats right. and, and go up there and make those formats happen, which is true. You can do that so that all your heading one formats are consistent. Right. But Word, it also gives Word information. Word now knows that that is a heading one, a main heading on a page, or it's a heading two subheading or, you know, uh, all those things. So learning how to properly create that structure, what that structure should look like, you know, just clicking those buttons is not enough. You actually right. want to learn a little bit about how the structure should go. Um, that can go a long way to, um, to uh, making it accessible. And then of course, right, the big, the big one everybody talks about, and that is if you're including images in that document, you really do need to evaluate whether or not they need a text equivalent and provide that. Right. Um, if, if they do, right. um, you know, and simplifying content, keeping, you know, keeping content very perceivable so somebody can quickly get where they need to be is, is also helpful. Yeah, so you're right. It really is so much just like what we discussed as far as yeah. websites go, except that now you have control over it and you can right. easily go in and make these changes, unlike with perhaps a website. That's right. right. Yep. Yeah. Cool. And then with PowerPoint, uh, I assume it's pretty similar. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the things that you would be concerned with, with uh, in concerned with in a document, you would also be concerned with in a PowerPoint presentation that you were presenting, that you were sharing online. Um, you know, in terms of that presentation itself, you know, those font sizes are going to get even larger because people are sitting obviously sure. far away. And um, using consistent themes, using um, you know, predictable formats. Uh, as you're, you know, so everything has a heading, that heading is appropriate to the content on the slide. You're not using the same heading over and over again. You know, um, th there's a lot of things that you can do like that that'll really help. And and I feel like those are tips for everyone. You know, when I'm sure. sitting there half in a day is trying to, uh, trying to keep my focus during a PowerPoint presentation, <laughs> I absolutely benefit from that kind of predictability, um, being able to easily right. see and perceive what's up there. And, um, you know, PowerPoint, obviously, even simpler. You're probably using a lot of list structures, bullet points, and stuff like that. One thing that uh, I know a, a lot of people who watch PowerPoints would be really happy about would be not using so many animations and transitions right. and things like that. So it's not just a benefit for someone uh, with a disability that perhaps a jarring transition or, or animation might mm -hmm. cause problems, but I think we're all just sort of tired of that. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, that's... I... <laughs> That's, that's like you see the commercial where the the, the guy t times his man bun being clipped off um, just as the fashion ends. I feel like that fashion has ended. Like ah, that. yes, yes. We, we just just people pretty much want it straightforward. They want a dynamic presenter and they want the PowerPoint to present to uh, um, so PowerPoint should be person saying to keep them on track. It should be the background, not the foreground, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. The background, not the foreground. Right. And to your point, this is one interesting thing and one of the most fascinating aspects of accessibility that I find. Um, I've had the um, benefit of going to CSUN, which is one of the largest accessibility conferences in the world, yes. a few years running. And um, there's a, a presentation that's happened um, a couple of times from, I, I apologize if I mess up his first name. I think it's Jared and the Lion. Um, but it's this uh a uh, gentleman that works for the BBC and he's on the autistic spectrum and he hits this really interesting spot where he's very sort of self-aware um, and has this ability to communicate the experience of somebody who's autistic to 
to people who aren't autistic. And um, it's a very popular um, presentation that he gives because it just gives this unbelievable insight. But listening to him talk about how um, distracting content, this is to your point about no crazy animations, can throw his mind into into kind of a, my words, not his, tailspin and, 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 and make it so it takes him a long time to come back around to something that is, you know, useful and relevant to, to the information being presented is amazing. And I've watched him uh, giving a presentation and in, in, um, it was in San Diego, so jets flew by and it actually, the sound of the jets uh, distracted him and he, he has headphones around his neck almost all the time. So he was thrown off for a minute and then pulled the headphones on and, and came back to task. But that was an example of how, you know, his filters for, uh, for uh, stimulation are, are not the same as somebody without autism right. and it really presents a challenge. So I think that that's, um, you know, to your point about the animation, it's really interesting to see how it can affect some people. Definitely. And I've had good luck using, uh, uh, I think all the Office apps, the Microsoft Office apps, mm -hmm. have a uh, check accessibility feature, which I found is a nice tool. Uh, very much like with web online testing, though, you, it's, it's guidelines. It doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. know whether the image is relevant or not, for example, but it'll tell you that mm -hmm. there's no alt text. So, and again, it's a good tool, but as long as you use it the right way, uh, you know, it, it, can be a, right. it can be a help. Yep. So uh, one other quick question before we, we wrap up, uh, PDF files. Uh, I've heard so many things about the accessibility of PDF files, and some people will say that they're the worst thing ever, and others will say, well, they don't have to be. It depends. Uh, without getting too much into the weeds on it, because uh, mm -hmm. I know it's a complicated subject, uh, what are some of the basics about making sure that uh, if you convert something to a PDF that it's accessible? Well, yeah, and, and we can't get into the weeds too much, right? But that's right. my uh, original admission there that I'm not a t technical person. True. Uh, but everything that we've talked about, uh, so, so now, you know, think of that Word document that we just talked about as a source document. That's, that's mm -hmm. what you're going to start in. You don't create a PDF by itself. You create something else, and it turns into a PDF. Exactly. So doing everything you can in that source document is obviously the first step. And if you have a good source document, chances are you're going to have a pretty good PDF. Um, but PDFs themselves can be made accessible, or you can you can further increase the accessibility of the PDF. Um, and a lot of the more uh, you know uh, robust products from Adobe um, will allow you to to take that accessibility one step further. And I'm not going to get into how that happens because that's that's the weeds that you were talking sure, about. Sure, exactly. And I'm not sure I'm the person to do that for you, anyways. Um, but if you start off with a good source document and, and you and you learn to use some of those um, uh, features of the of the uh, Adobe um, products, uh, you can take that PDF and and make it uh, further make it accessible. But what a lot of people do is they'll turn it over to a company like ours. Um, and again, there's many many options out there um, for uh, having somebody else go in, a professional that understands the guidelines. Right. So that's right. kind of the other piece we're talking. You, you can kind of separate it a little bit, you know, thinking about accessibility as just an individual trying to do your best from people who really are experts in the guidelines and are and are trying to um, focus on the guidelines. So um, the U.S. federal government guidelines, the Section 508 guidelines. Um, so if you're creating a PDF for the federal government, they've required that, that hits these 508 guidelines. And these tools are right. really help you do that. And, and an expert that knows the guidelines can help you do that. So it may be that you want to turn that PDF over to um, a professional and have them do it or take some classes and learn how to do it like a professional yourself. Right. Um, but the bottom line is, it doesn't matter whether they're good or they're not. And, you know, a PDF is a format. It's widely used out there. So Indeed. I would really say moreover is to, um, uh, you know, you have a responsibility to figure out how to present that PDF in the most accessible way possible. And the one thing I would definitely say uh, off and about PDFs is that if your PDF was created because you scanned a document, it's completely oh, yeah. inaccessible. And that's don't right. Put those on your website. Don't share those because they cannot be a screen reader yeah. sees it as one big photograph and that's it. That's right. That is the ultimate example of an image containing content, context, right? Content. Right, right. 
Well, this has been great. Thanks so much for, for joining us, Mark, and, and, and discussing this often overlooked topic. Oh, you're, you're absolutely welcome, Keith. I, I, like I said in the beginning, I, I think you guys do great stuff. Um, I love, uh, you know, just the whole concept of you first um, and putting the rights of individuals with disabilities first. And um, so it's my pleasure to be on here and, and help you guys uh, with that effort. Great. Thanks so much. The You First podcast is produced by Disability Rights Florida, a not for profit corporation working to protect and advance the rights of Floridians with disabilities through advocacy and education. If you or a family member has a disability and feel that your rights have been violated in some way, please contact Disability Rights Florida. We provide free and confidential services, including information and referral, advocacy, legal representation and negotiations, and investigation and facility monitoring. Our goals include access to education, employment, and independence, better laws, policies, and practices, and elimination of abuse and neglect. You can learn more about the services we provide, explore a vast array of resources on a variety of disability-related topics, and complete an online intake on our website at www.disabilityrightsflorida.org. You can also call us at one 800 342 8 Two, three. Thank you to everyone for listening to this episode of the You First podcast or reading the transcript online. Please email any feedback about the show to podcast at disabilityrightsflorida.org. <laughs>